Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Evan. I'm an independent Salesforce consultant based in Baltimore, Maryland. I've been in the Salesforce ecosystem since 2012. I've worked for a number of small nonprofit companies, for-profit companies. I started dabbling in consulting in 2019 and then became a full-time independent Salesforce consultant in 2020. Uh, it's been a wild ride getting into the consulting space during COVID and learning to you know, work remotely with clients and still add value to their Salesforce implementations. Today, what we're talking about is something that I've deployed for a few different clients. And if you were at the last session about a month ago, we went through building the basics of um, setting up a screen flow and deploying it on an experienced cloud site. Um, I do have the chat open, so if you have questions throughout, feel free to ask them. I see David's asking about the recording. We do have the recording going now, so she will be able to post this once the session is over, along with all these slides. Excellent. So I'll do a quick recap on what we built last time. It was just about getting the basic configuration set up. Uh, at the end, we had a very simple flow that lived on an experienced cloud URL. Um, anybody could access this page without being logged into Salesforce, and it allowed you to enter a first name, last name, email, and it would create a contact record in Salesforce without being logged in. So that's, you know, the most basic uh, form you could set up. There are thousands of use cases for something like this. You could facilitate email sign up for like a newsletter. You could do an event registration form any situation where you need to collect data from somebody on a public website and uh, do something with that, with the data in your internal Salesforce org, whether that's creating a record, updating a record, you can use the basic mechanics of a solution like this. Now, at the very end of the last session, I had a poll where I asked you what, is, you know, what advanced topics would you want to learn more about? And the three top answers from that poll where the three topics we're gonna to be discussing today. Um, so first up, the top three answer on that poll was about dynamic choices. How do we use data from our Salesforce implementation in order to drive the choices that show up on a public flow screen form that we've set up to be accessible to the open public? There's a number of options you have to do this. So I'll go through each one and sort of why that one would be useful to you and sort of talk through some, some examples here. Uh, these first two collection choice set and record choice set, they both involve getting records from your Salesforce database. Uh, there are some slight differences for which one you would want to use depending on if you need to use that collection of records in other places in your Salesforce flow. So let's start with this first one, a collection choice set. What we do here is we're able to feed a collection of records into a pick list or a radio button uh, input type uh, using a record collection that we retrieved earlier in the flow before the screen was loaded. What's useful about that is you can use that collection multiple times throughout your flow, you might be generating that collection on like maybe the first screen of your flow, you get people to enter some data and you add records to a collection and then you want to reuse that later. Uh, there's lots of patterns where you're sort of managing that collection of records first and then allowing that to be input. So let's look at how we would set up something like that. Here's the flow we left off with last time. All we need to do to grab records from our database is use a get records uh, data element here. So I can do something like get the topics. I had set up an advanced topics custom object. That's where I had stored all the information about the advanced topics you voted on with a quick description. And I've added a couple other custom fields to that. So let's say I just want to get all of them. Um, I can query for those topics and sort them in any order I want and make sure I get all the records here. Uh, 
once I have that collection of records, I could add a question to my screen, the next element here, that will use one of the pick list options or the multi-select pick list. Um, I can start with just a simple one first, just to show you how that works. So I'll call this advanced topic. Maybe the label can say, which advanced topic are you most interested in? Well, this is just a simple example. So think of asking any question where you want people to choose an answer based on a set of records that you query for out of your database. Uh, so here's a pick list choice. I'm sorry, uh, somebody's asking if you're sharing screen, probably you have to reshare. Oh, let me try that again. Make sure I'm sharing the whole window here. Three. Are you seeing the flow screen now? Or are you still seeing the uh, slideshow? You can see the screen, yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, I thought I was sharing the whole window. Perfect. Um, so let's go through this. Uh, I set up a pick list question here, and I'm asking which advanced topic are you most interested in? For the choices, I can create a new choice resource. This is what informs your pick list choice. Where should I get the options from? So when we open that up, we have the four different topics that I was showing on that slide. Um, so we have those, you know, resource types that we can use, and there are some slight differences to them. So we're going to go through each one of them real quick. The choice, this first option, it's just like manually setting up a choice. It has nothing to do with any data in your, in your Salesforce org. That one's very straightforward. It's not really dynamic at all, but if you needed to like set up just manual choices, you have that option. A collection choice set, that's our first example here. So we're going to generate a set of choices based on a collection of records we retrieve before the screen loaded. That's exactly what we're doing here. I'll call this um, all advanced topics. And then for the collection, we can choose any record collection variable that already has values in it. So that get records I did earlier called advanced topics, I can go ahead and choose that. Now they let you set up the label and the value for this choice set. So the label is going to be what people see on the screen. So we're going to, want to use the name of the record for that, something human intelligible. But when we actually go to work with and process this form submission, we might want to use a different piece of data from that record. For example, the record ID is going to be much more useful to us so that we could do something like related to the contact. Um, so th in this way, we can have this sort of mapping where we're showing one value and we're utilizing a different value as we process this submission. So here's how I've set that up. And even though we've added a single choice here, because that one choice resource is pulling from a collection of records, it's gonna result in us seeing multiple options in this pick list screen. So let's go ahead and check out how this works. So I'll save it as a new version. With advanced topic question. And I can go ahead and activate and we can check it out on our, so one of the things I wanted to point out with these form uh, flow screen solutions, as you make new versions of your flow, wherever you've distributed it on your Experience Cloud site, it's always gonna use the active version of your flow. So if we make a change like I just did and activate it, next time somebody reloads this public page that we've linked to from our website. Oh, I, got, I did a couple things here. Give me one second. <laughs> Let's get rid of this. Publish. 
Anytime we make changes to our flow and activate a new version, we instantly have uh, that new version distributed to our site. And just like that, I have our new question here. And for that choice, let me zoom in for you. Which advanced topic are you most interested in? I have all the names of those records that I've set up in that custom object. So pretty cool, easy way to uh, connect your choices to the records in your database. Uh, the other good thing about this is, say you were to add another advanced topic internally, uh, that new record you create is instantly going to show up as a choice next time somebody loads that form. So over here I have my custom object with all my records that I've created and by creating a new one, I can easily amend the choices on that pick list field. So this is one of the, the ways to help streamline an operational process. I've had a lot of clients who would have to maintain these different silos of data independently, where they might have their internal records and then they have a form on their website and every time they make a change in one place, they have to manually replicate it somewhere else. And it, it, it can become a real struggle to keep those in sync. So by using these dynamic choices, you can help eliminate some of that translation and that extra work. So that's a pretty cool way to, to handle something like that. Um, let's talk about another option you have. Instead of using the collection choice set, uh, you can use a record choice set. It's almost exactly the same. But what happens here is you don't need to set up a get records beforehand. You can have a pick list question or a multi-select pick list question query for the records at runtime. So it's as the screen loads, it's going to run that query. Essentially, it's doing that get records for you behind the scenes. It will retrieve any records that meet your criteria and use them as choices. That's handy if you don't need to use that collection anywhere else in your screen flow. Uh, it does help to simplify your flow canvas a little bit. And it could be useful if you're doing something like manipulating records and saving them to the database. And then on the next screen, you want to query for them live. I don't know, maybe you have a use case for something like that. Uh, this next option could help you facilitate that. So let's come in here and I can, instead of using the choice I set up earlier, I can set up a new one. So I'll make a new choice resource. And this time I'll use the record choice set. Advanced topics choice set. What's happening here is I'm actually specifying, this looks exactly like a get records, doesn't it? So you choose which object you're going to retrieve from, you choose uh, any filter criteria you want to add. You can specify the maximum number of choices. So say I only want to pull in five choices and I can sort it you know, ascending or descending by some value. Maybe I'll do it based on created date. Give me the five newest advanced topic choices here. And then we're combining that get records element with the uh, choice configuration where we can still have a different label versus what value we're interacting with. So down here, I can still use the name of the record for the display value, and then I can utilize the ID for further processing, AKA like creating a, a relationship or a junction record or whatever you wanna do. The other interesting thing about this record choice set is you can store more of the values from the selected record into other fields in your flow. So this is where you could maybe pull in uh, so whatever other information you have, maybe the, the product, and you want to store that in some other variable in your flow. That way you can utilize that product value from the selected choice that the person made when they were using the screen flow and use that in further processing. And here you can set up multiple fields. So there's a lot of flexibility to grab a ton of values from that selected record and use them later on. 
that's pretty cool. Okay, let's see how this looks with our um, with our sort and our maximum number of choices. I'll get done on that. We're going to use that choice set for our question: which advanced topic are you most interested in? I'll save this as an inversion. I mean, this time I'll just run it in debug. You get the same idea that it'll, once I activate it, it would show up on the, on the site there. Let's go ahead and do that actually. Perfect. So if I reload my form, this is now pulling in the five most recently created advanced topics and letting people choose from that. A, lot, a ton of flexibility here to use your data dynamically for these choices in a flow. Pick list choice set. This one is really handy if you have an existing pick list set up and you want to use those choices as a, a question on your public facing form. So a good use case here is maybe Elton John is filling out our form and he really is proud of his knighthood. So he really wants to say, Sir Elton John, but we don't have an input field here for him to put in his, his honorable mention here. So what we can do is we can add to our screen flow and add a pick list field. I'll put this up here. Salesforce calls this salutation. It's usually called an, an honorable or um, something like that in other systems. Uh, here, we can use a pick list component. And for the choices, this is similar to what we've done for the other ones. But we can use a pick list choice set, which will generate a set of choices based on the pick list values from one of your fields set up in Salesforce. So let's go ahead and use that, and we'll call this salutation choices. The object is contact. and the data type, you can choose pick list or multi-select pick list here. And then for the field, we can choose our salutation field. And I'll go in the default order that those values show up. You have other options here if you wanted to sort those differently. Uh, typically, that would just be alphabetical ascending or descending. So once I've added that, uh, we'll activate this. So I'll save that as a new version and activate. And then we'll tell our good friend Elton John, he can now go load our form page and he'll be able to fill in all of this information. Here we go, this is perfect. Elton John can tilt this in. And now we're pulling those choices from that salutation field. Now you'll notice we don't have the SIR option, S-I-R. -S we don't have that in here yet. Uh, we forgot to do that, right? Uh, Salesforce out of the box doesn't come with that salutation pick list choice. So what we can do is we don't need to do this in multiple places. We can go to the contact object in our Salesforce org. And just how we would add a pick list value to any other field. Place. So under the name field on the contact record, you have the salutation pick list. And then over here, you're able to edit those choices. This is actually new in Lightning. It used to be you had to switch back in the classic to edit these salutation pick list choices. They finally uh, have some parity here in the Lightning experience. If I come to this pick list, I can add a new option. Call this sir, hit save. Now this shows up as an option on all my contact records internally, but it now also will work for this public form I set up that is connected to that pick list field. So now Elton John can come in and say, Sir Elton John. Very handy way to make sure all of your interactions with your data are consistent, are connected, and 
you ha have the ability to just maintain them in one spot. So definitely recommend using these uh, dynamic choices. The last one I'll show is you can also utilize a dependent pick list. There is a dependent pick list component available for screen flows, and you can map that to an existing uh, dependent pick list configuration you have set up. So the one I've set up is on our advanced topics object. I have priority here and let's see the field dependencies. I have this uh, priority field is a controlling field for available time. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm gonna allow people to submit a new advanced topic. And one of the questions is how big a priority is this for you, high, medium, or low? And based on that answer, I ask, well, how much available time do you have to talk about this? And I have a bunch of answers for available time, uh, 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 minutes. And I have a dependency set up that if you say something's high priority, I need at least 20 minutes of your time to explain that advanced topic. Whereas if something's a low priority, maybe I could do a quick recap in five minutes. So I have this uh, dependent pick list field set up here. And I can add that to my screen flow. This is using the dependent pick list input. And here you're actually configuring up to three fields. It's uh, if you had three fields in a dependent pick list configuration, you could set up all three. I only have two and two is the minimum you can do here. Uh, so this would be priority and available time. Object API name, this will be advanced topic. And then you have to put in the API names for your pick list. So the first one is priority. And the second one is available to time. You get to choose the labels. Uh, if you don't enter a label, then the default is just using the label from that field. Make sure I got this set up right. That's all we really need to set up there. I'll go ahead and activate this new version. This instance shows up on my external form here. Not like that. I knew something didn't work right. The option. Interesting. Okay. I might have some other permission you need to enable to get this working. Um, let's keep it together. Privileges. Well, that's how it goes with live demos sometimes. So theoretically, you should be able to use this dependent pick list and map to that uh, dependent pick list configuration you have set up. It is another handy way to keep things consistent and make sure people are only choosing options that should be available to them based on the priority mapping we have set up here. So I'll look into what other permission might be needed to do that. I know there's some API calls that are happening behind the scenes here. We might just need to grant an additional permission in order to get this working.
the fact that it's not showing me here in preview mode means I must have screwed something up, but I cannot quite figure it out here. Let's move on and maybe we'll come back to that at the end. Okay, so that was all about our dynamic choices and there's tons of options for using your Salesforce data. The next topic people voted on last time was pre-filling a form using URL parameters. So this is a fun one. It's a great way to allow people to see a form that's filled out with a ton of information and just make edits to that. Um, it helps speed up the, you know, the process. It's good for like confirming things and having people just make changes that need to, to be tweaked. There's a couple steps for this, but it's not too difficult. Um, first thing we'll do is set up a variable resource that's available for input in our flow. So I'll come back over here. Let's get rid of this so it doesn't cause us issues later. Say I want to use this form, but have it pre-fill with somebody's uh, information so that they could simply make updates to it. I can set up a new resource here, a variable. I want to call this like contact. Uh, actually, I'll just call it ID. We can call it anything we want. I'll call it contact ID. Data type is going to be text. And then we want to make this variable available for input. This is the way we'll have an option to pass a value into this variable. So I'll set that up and then we can, you know, set up the configuration to use that input variable in order to go get some data from our database. So what we'll do here is add a get records element. This will be called get contact. It's just a query for the contact object. And we're going to search for a record where the ID equals that contact ID text variable that we just set up. We don't need to sort it. We only need the first record and we can go ahead and automatically store all fields. So once we've done that, we can start to use any information from that contact record in our form. So the way we can set this up to make it useful for us we will set up default values for our screen input elements. So, yeah. Step two here, specify that resource as the default value for input components. So that's what we'll do next. For this salutation, we can scroll down to that contact from the get contact, uh, get records element, and pull in that salutation value. Or first name, you can do the same thing. Go to that contact and grab the first name, last name, go to the contact, get the last name, and email. We have all those fields set with default values. Uh, now we're going to activate this flow version and then we have to set up one other thing on the Experience Cloud site to make this work. So let's save this as a new version. Sometimes called pre-fill and other form solution tools. Um, might be default values, uh, might be uh, called something else. I'll activate this new version. Now back on the experience builder side, I'm going to refresh this page. Now that I have a new flow version active that has a variable set up for input, uh, we can make an additional configuration here. When you click on your flow element that's on your experience builder page, you get to choose the name of the flow, but then any variables that accept input show up here and allow you to specify a value. 
Now this is where we get into the URL parameters part of this configuration. This is allowing you to say, what value do you want to put in the contact ID flow variable? So we need to name our URL parameter. And what I like to do is use all lowercase letters for URL parameters. Generally, that's uh, how URLs are going to resolve. I think it's, it's good to be mindful of that, that you're not using mixed case or whatever you decide, you're consistent as you do this. Um, as you set up, you know, generally for these solutions, you're going to be in control over those URLs going out, but depending on your use case, you might not be, but it's definitely something that's case sensitive. So make sure you're doing what you think you're doing as you're setting these up. So I'm going to use something very simple, just lowercase ID, and you need to wrap it in essentially merge field syntax. So there's curly braces and there's an exclamation point. It makes this something uh, where the flow is going to grab whatever value from the URL parameters that matches this attribute name. I'll zoom in on that. It's curly brace, exclamation point, and then whatever you want to call your URL parameter. I'm just going to simply call it ID. Once I've done that, I can publish this Experience Cloud page. It's essentially saving it and pushing it out to the internet. So I'll publish that. This typically goes through in about three or four seconds. Now, what's going to happen here is on our public site, I can still reload this page and It'll work just fine without any URL parameters. Uh, it shows up as a blank form. But I now have the option to add a URL parameter here. If you haven't done that before, you simply add a question mark, and then you can specify any name. We're going to use ID to match what we've set up. Put an equal sign, and then you can put a value. And it's going to assign a value to that URL parameter. This is something you would typically set up in like an email template where you want to send an email to one of your contacts and say, hey, can you verify your information in our system? Click this link to update your record in our system. I can come over here to any one of these contact records. And in my email template, I would pull in the record ID as a merge field and merge it into a URL for like that button. It looks like this. And the end result should be the URL for our form, our flow screen form, followed by any URL parameters set to the values from that record. When I load the page with this URL, now it's going to pull in the first name, last name, email from that example contact. And they can come through and make adjustments to these values. And then you could take that information and save it back to that contact record. So this is a great way to, to do some of that internal database updates. I do want to caution people with solutions like this. And it's something that comes up with any of the other third party form tools. You need to be very careful that you're only displaying information you're comfortable with the internet having access to. So again, there's no logging in with any of this solution so far. You do have that option if you wanted to, to go that route. But for these public forms, if you're querying for a contact record and showing sensitive information on the screen, somebody else could get a hold of that URL and be able to load up that same information. So be very careful with how you configure something like this. Uh, the same is true if you're using a uh, form stack or a form assembly or any of those other tools. I see a couple questions. Rachel, yes, if there's time, we can take a look at troubleshooting that permission issue. Um, Jeff is asking, am I correct in assuming you can use this URL parameter to pull in and make one or more of the resulting fields read only in the public flow screen? Great question. Yes. Uh, let's show that real quick. You can make decisions 
or use conditional visibility based on um, values that you've retrieved in a Git records element. All we've done so far is just facilitate getting information from the URL, from a URL parameter into the flow. And then our flow is doing what it would normally do and just saying, hey, go find a contact record that uh, is equal to that variable's value. So that being said, yes, we could totally make a decision here and show something as read only. Best way to do that might be to use like a display text that gives you the most control. All this like read only info. And then in here, you could say something like first name. And then from that contact record, that get contact, I can pull in the value for first name here. So that's one way to do it. And then for condition uh, component visibility, you can show this anytime that uh, that get contact record you know has a value, or if there's some other way you want to determine if it's read only or not. Uh, you could do a decision. So sometimes you might not know if you're going to find a record or not. Might be another way to handle this. After your get records, you can add a decision that simply checks, like, did I find a record? Was a contact found? Or the outcome could be contact found. The default outcome could be no contact. In here for the outcome conditions, if you simply choose a record variable and check to see if it's null or not. If it is null false, like this, you'll know that a contact record was found. Otherwise, there was no contact found. And what's handy about the decisions, you have access to the outcome paths without setting up anything else. What I used to do was set up like an assignment element here and assign it to a variable which still totally works, but we can cut out that step. And in our, our screen, now that we have that decision element, we can simply reference that in our component visibility. So I can check um, if contact found that decision outcome. You'll notice there's a Boolean variable available to you. So you can check to see if that equals true. And if so, this first name would show up um, as read-only mode. So what I'll do is I'll drag that up here and I'll do the opposite component visibility on this one. So I can say uh, contact found does not equal true. And you'll notice I set this up very intentionally to say does not equal true. Uh, sometimes your decision outcomes, if that decision element doesn't get evaluated, all of the outcomes are null. It's only when that decision does get evaluated that it gets set to true or false. So one way you can handle that in, in all cases is simply check if an outcome equals true or if an outcome does not equal true. And that way you'll handle both the null and the false case. That's pro tip there. Uh, let's activate this version and see how it looks. So if we find a contact, we should show the first name field in read-only mode. I activate this version, reload my public flow screen here. Now we have some fields are editable, but some fields based on conditional visibility are in read only mode. Pretty cool stuff. Thanks for that question. Uh, this is useful for a lot of situations where you want to pre-fill a form. Uh, you could pre-fill with answers if you have a single form, but maybe somebody wants to set up the URL to use different sets of answers. You have a ton of flexibility here to feed it a parameter and then use that to make decisions, query for the records you need, and then you could use that in like pick list values and totally customize how that flow is going to behave 
based on the URL parameter that you feed to it. Coupling this with email templates uh, is a really powerful way to, to make some dynamic experiences tailored for the recipients of, of your flow forms. Pretty cool stuff. Last thing I wanted to show is the third advanced topic people voted for was embedding a form in a website. Everything I've showed so far is, you know, we've got this built in site hosted for us through Experience Cloud. We have this URL, which you could easily link to. And a lot of times that's the easiest way to deploy one of your flow form solutions is simply whatever you're doing on your website, just link to this URL. I've had some clients who want to embed one of these forms into their own third party website. It's a little bit more complicated, but we can set that up. So there's a couple steps I'll walk you through here. First thing we need to do is you need to add your website to the cores allowed origins list in the setup menu. What that does is it allows Salesforce to load all of the flow resources on this third party site. So I've gone ahead and done that for get back to the setup menu here. I set this up on a, or I will be setting it up on a fiddle, a JS fiddle. Uh, but you want to make sure in your course settings, whatever domains you have set up for your organization, uh, set them up here so that you can utilize this solution. I'm going to pretend that my third party site is this JS fiddle and we'll set up a flow that gets embedded here. Okay, our next step is to create a Lightning application. So our Lightning app is really the just overall container for um, deploying this flow as an embedded component on a third party website. I also wanna point out, this is not an iframe. So we don't have to worry about all those weird issues that come up with iframes. What we're doing here is we're going to actually insert HTML elements into this third party site, which is why the security needs to be set up accordingly. This Lightning application uses Lightning Out. So I have the documentation linked down here. These slides will be shared uh, so you have access to that. This Lightning application just has one resource within it. It's a Lightning component that we're going to set up next. I'm going to copy that and come back over here into our org. And in the developer console, we can set up this Lightning application. I'm going to file new Lightning application. We'll call this and our own. And we're going to app, and submit. And here's all the markup you need for that. It needs to be global. It needs to use Lightning Out. And then in order to use it on a flow that is set up for guest access, you need to allow guest access here. Uh, we're going to come back to this piece uh, once we set up our component. So within our Lightning application, we need to set up a component. And this one's also very simple. There's actually nothing you need to change on this one. So this is straight up just copy paste for the basics at least. I'll set up a new Lightning component. We'll call this San Ramon component and submit. And in the markup here, what we're doing is making this available for all page types that allows us to use it on a flow screen. And then we can also use flow actions. So the navigation actions that go to the next screen, uh, we need to allow that to happen too. Access here is also global. And then we have a handler that when this component loads, just calls an action from the controller. Uh, the only other thing we have is there's going to be a flow in this component. Uh, called flow data. And we also have another controller action here on status change event. Again, there's nothing you need to change on this. Uh, just paste this in. 
Once we have a name of our component, we can specify that back on our Lightning app. So this is going to be called Save our known component. We can save that first one. And then in here, we're also going to create a controller. And this is the JavaScript that helps make this component run. That one's a little bit longer. Uh, so this JavaScript markup has one change we need to make in order to connect it to the flow we intend to use. So when this component initializes, basically when it first loads, what we want to do is uh, for that flow attribute that we've set up, we want to start a flow. And here's where we specify the, the flow API name. So I'll come over into my flow and grab that API name from the properties. And if we switch back over here, we can paste that in. That's the only update you would need to make that. Uh, again, I'll share all these slides and you'll see the capital letters for what you need to replace. This is just the basics of getting a flow to uh, navigate and finish. So there's not too much going on here. If you wanted to get really fancy with feeding in URL parameters to a flow that's embedded in your third party website, you will have to make a few other changes to this, uh, which is all noted in the documentation for Lightning Out. Uh, essentially, for this start flow element, it does accept an additional parameter here, which you can feed it a, an array of objects and you can specify the input input variable as well as the value for that variable. So you have some options there to, to feed input into a flow embedded on your third party website. So we're taking everything all together that we've showed here today. Let's start with a simple example, just getting it to work. We can iterate on it. So I've saved our controller. I'll come back and I will save the component. These both went through excellently. Last thing we'll do is we need to add a script to our web page. I've done it all in HTML for now, just to show the simple example. If you are fancier about splitting out your HTML markup from your JavaScript, you can take the basics I'm showing here and organize that a little bit more appropriately. Uh, so I have these components all set up. I can come over to my website. I'm gonna use this as my website today. And all we need to do is set up a, a container for where we want our flow to live. Uh, you might have other markup on your page. And then there's two scripts that need to run. The first one is accessing all of the lightning out resources. So this is pulling in the ability for lightning out to operate. And our second script is loading up our lightning out app and then uh, creating that component. And this is where that HTML elements are getting created on the fly on your third party website. So here's where we need to specify our app names. This is San Ramon. What did I call that? San Ramon app. And down here for the component is where I'm calling that component I set up, San Ramon component. Last thing we need to do is, well, first I should mention your lightning out resources. The end of the URL is the same across all orgs, slash lightning slash lightning dot out dot JS. The first part, I would recommend linking it to the same organization. Um, I'm set up in a developer instance here, uh, screenflow forms dot dev or slash dev dash ed. I can take that same, you know, whatever organization you're set up, make sure you have the base URL for that same organization. Uh, same is true down here. There's a site endpoint. So this is pointing to your experience cloud site. Even though you're embedding your, um, you're embedding your flow on a third party site, it still needs to have that guest user access. And this piece here is what specifies which site you're connected to. 
So every time you set up one of these sites, you get a guest user profile by default. And your embedded code here needs to know what user essentially to run this flow as. So this site endpoint allows you to control that. Uh, so use that same site that you have set up. You can use the generic URL. There's nothing extra you need to do. Just make sure it's set up with your organization. Same is true if you want to test this in sandboxes versus production. Uh, you can align the site endpoint to your sandbox here along with the lightning out resources and keep your sandboxes and productions separated in that way. Cool. So this is the whole script. Uh, all it's doing is creating a component and then it says uh, go put that in the DOM location that has the ID of container. So it's going to just embed that flow wherever this container shows up on your website markup. Let's go ahead and run it. Oh, this is where I screwed up, sorry. This part's right. Down here, we actually need the, not the base of our uh, internal implementation, but our actual site here. So that's for this. So this should be the base URL for your experience cloud site. Site.com. Perfect. Let's try that again. There we go. So when our page loads, it's going to load up that flow. And if we inspect this, it has actually created all of those HTML elements within the document. So it's not an iframe at all. It actually creates all the divs and adds the scripts in order to run our flow. Now this is pretty cool. It runs exactly the same as our, in our version we had hosted on the Experience Cloud site. Um, it will do the conditional visibility is even showing up. So we don't see the read-only first name. We see the, uh, the input version. All of our pick list connectivities Still working, so it's pulling those pick list values. Uh, we can specify first, last name, and uh, create a contact here. Our last five advanced topics. So if you get it working on your Experience Cloud site and you take these extra steps to embed it, you should have the same functionality. Where you might want to get a little bit more picky is with styling this component. And once it gets embedded on the site, you could do that in your own third party site CSS and just target these different components and style it however you want it to appear. That's generally the easiest way to go about styling one of these. Perfect. I know that's a lot of information. Wanted to give you at least the highlights here. Um, if you have questions, uh, feel free to come off mute and ask them now. We can uh, go through anything else you might want to see. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, I had one question uh, regarding, uh, you know, in the Experience Cloud site, uh, yeah. we have a tracking. We want to put a tracking field or a hidden field to indicate where the contact is coming from. Sure. Uh, create a list view based out of that. You want to do a hidden field, so it's something you. How would you get that information? Uh, 
So basically, I mean, uh, what we can do is possibly like say the guest, like somebody there, like five guest books, maybe, let's say like an extreme example, and guest book one, guest book two, and you can put a hidden field with guest book one. Uh, is that like every time somebody fills up a form, it will populate with guest book one. So we know what the source of the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you set up, you know, a new resource, you, know, you can use a static value if you want. Um, when you create your contact, you can use any of your flow variables here and just map it to another field. So like if this was leads, for example, and you wanted to say like the lead source, you could use anything you want really to populate a certain value without anybody ever having to see it. So uh -huh. it could, yeah, you could set up a form that way. Uh, you could do it with UL parameters if you wanted to. Uh, lots of options to get a certain, essentially a hidden value onto the record that you're creating. All right, so if you put a URL parameter, it would be dynamic then, right? Because we're on the phone. Yeah, right. right. Cool. Uh, so basically to keep it hidden from everyone, we basically give no, uh, FLS has to be not, no FLS, right? Um, yeah, you don't need to actually grant field level security for the guest user profile for anything we've done here. Like I've locked it down completely. If you remember from last time, we're running this flow in system context without sharing and allowing it to access all data. That allows the guest user to see anything that we have posted on the screen here. So if you don't put an element here on the screen to show that value, essentially it's hidden and it's hidden at the the profile level through Salesforce's security model. Uh, so the only things we're granting access to are the visible elements on the screen. In fact, all of the actions that are taken are done server side. So it's not anything that profile has access to do. And in fact, that profile can't create a contact through API calls. Only this flow can create contacts with the information they've supplied on the screen. Yeah. And uh, we can configure the list view based out of that field. And uh, oh. oh, yeah, internally, yeah, any data on the contact object, you could set up list views for, you know, based on email, based on that lead source, that hidden value you've populated. Uh, that way you could see who are all the leads that came through the web if you're feeding in that web value. Yeah. Got it. Everybody seemed to have understood this very well. Yeah, yeah, we, we, this, we have, we have a like really practical and it's really awesome session that you did right now. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Right. And Evan, another one, like while we have you, uh, how do you do the uh, domain masking, right? Because Shiba did the website. If you go down to her website, it's sfbcshiba.com, but it uh, is set up through uh, Salesforce. So basically, if you go there, it will go back and redirect it to the, you know, the site's URL. Yeah. Uh, as a domain, as a dot com slash out, that kind of stuff, right? Different pages that you create. Yeah. Yeah. You wanted to like use your own custom domain name for. Yeah. You can uh, so if you want to go down to like, SF, like you can try it out, sfdcshiba.com. Uh, except that it is uh, HTTP uh, instead of HTTPS. Okay. Enter. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't go. Oh, yeah, that's another one. It's it's HTTP uh, instead of HTTPS. Is HTTP? HTTPS. Yeah, okay. no, not no S. I'll have to do that too. Oh, that's another one. Uh, across the Wait, it's not working. Okay. Yeah. HTTP and then that's it. Yeah. Then. No. Oh, there it is. Yeah. There we go. Oh, you check, understand that part too. Then maybe I have to set it up. But a, how do you do the domain masking for the? Yeah, first domain masking, then we go to other more complicated stuff later. Yeah. So you wanted to keep that SFDC Shiba in the first part. <laughs> yeah, and hide this part. You shown the website, right? Of somebody that you're done. It looked like a normal website, right? Kind of thing. Dot com. Yeah. Um, stuff, right? Yeah, I can show you. So, like, I've set up my. First example was doing it for my own website. So I have pontersolutions.com. Um, I had do I did go through the steps of figuring out how to get the HTTP and HTTPS to work. Uh, but that URL, this is my custom domain. 
and it's just navigating to an Experience Cloud site. And all of this is hosted on Experience Cloud. Uh, the answer here is about setting up the right CNAME records. So there's a couple configuration steps you'll have to do on your DNS, as well as in Salesforce in order to connect that up. But then you can have your custom domain, like I'm doing here, route to that Experience Cloud site. So if you want to click on blog, for example, for your website. Uh, yeah. So this actually links to a, a third party blog, but well, you could set up other pages here on your experience. This was more of a just yeah. concept in order to make sure I could get all the URLs to, to work appropriately. So basically, uh, if I were to set it up like a normal website, like slash about slash. Yeah. So basically, it will be different pages, but yeah. Yeah, so that you can do all the same um, like sitemap that you do on any other website. Essentially, when you're looking at a, an experienced cloud site, it's like a Squarespace or uh, any one of those other website builders. Right. What we did last time is we set up a page for internal page name. But you can actually create sub pages here and have you know slash internal page slash form and, and you can keep going down and create your hierarchy. Uh, what you're looking at here is sort of the top level, and then you can nest different pages within each of these sections and create that. Right. And the basically the C name, right? It has to be properly um... yeah. You just need the C name for the overall domain to point to the Experience Cloud site, but everything, the subdirectories are all handled on the Experience Cloud part of it. So once you get that, that first C name record set up for the top level domain, the rest of it is just really easy to configure. Okay. And I'll try it out and just in case I land in trouble, I'll maybe change the separate, but it's great. Have okay. Rachel had a question about using record or collection choice sets. Uh, can you elaborate on your yes. question there, Rachel? Yes. So I actually I have a specific use case. I have a an internal screen flow for my users that helps them with a complex process. Okay. The initial um, input is from the record that they're that, that that they're taking the action from. So it's getting a bunch of information there. But later on in the flow, they need to find another record in some okay. cases. Um, I've had trouble narrowing that list. I think I understand how to do it now by getting in a search input from the user. So yeah. my question is, would the best practice in this situation be to use their um, input to do a get records or can I skip that step then and use their input for the filters in the uh, in the collection? Yeah, uh, you can use their input for the filters. So this uh, topics choice set that I set up is one of these picklist choice or uh, collection choice sets. Where is it? Record choice set. Uh, if I were to filter this down. We could say like category equals, and here you have the ability to choose any uh, variable from your flow. So it could be something from a screen from earlier. So the category equals, you know, whatever they chose on the screen earlier. What's going to happen is on the first screen where they specify this input value that gets set, you're going to have to load whatever your second thing is further down in your flow on a subsequent screen, but it's going to run that query at that time and go grab those records that meet these conditions. Does that make and sense? It certainly does, but is one yeah. or the other option better in terms of how these things run? They will, so this is one option is to do it within the record choice set. It'll happen sort of behind the scenes when your screen loads. It's a great option. There's really nothing wrong with that, especially for the use case you're describing. You could set it up separately so that you do your Git records and essentially recreate that exact same scenario. The only difference is if you wanted to just run that query one time and use it both for that question you're about to ask and then something else further down in your flow. 
Uh, doing the Git records yourself allows you to reuse that data, that record collection multiple times. Whereas if you do it in the, uh, what do they call it here? The record choice set, you only have access to that for pick list questions. Does that make sense? It does, thank you, that's yeah. helpful. Okay, the other thing I'll say is every time you set up one of these, it is running that query when the screen loads. So if you had four or five screens that are all using that same collection of records, that query is running every time that screen loads. You might notice a little bit of lag if you're doing that a lot of times. So it could be more efficient to just do the query once and then reuse that collection on every screen without having to redo that query every time. Great, thank you. Yeah, great question. Anybody else? Yeah, sorry, what were you saying? I thought we were watching the recording. Trying to make it work. Let's we'll try it out ourselves. It's yeah, pretty complicated. So, stuff. Sunil is saying okay. we are going to record, are we going to try it, everything out. Okay. And then we'll send you any follow up questions if we have. Otherwise, yeah, so see, it looks easy. Right? That's why I said, okay, hey, domain masking looks easy. Then I put the C name there. It did not work, right? Then you put, oh, <sighs> it be, not yeah. Anything. It's like I could have done the domain pointer. So it's easy way out, but sales will make it so tough. But anyway, I hate the domain last thing. It's like always annoying. The C name record. No, no, C name is easy. Like if I want to take any domain name and point it to ABC website, it's easy, right? But Salesforce says do it this way. It takes two days before it populates a C name and everything. And it's yeah. the yes, I don't know. So can we? Yes. They have some particulars. I can dig up some instructions that I've done for other clients and send them to you so you can try to replicate that. Um, it's gonna depend on what you're using for DNS, the options you have available, and then just making sure the configuration aligns with what's on the Salesforce side. No, but DNS is anything because any domain name from the back end, you can create pointers, you can do stuff. Yeah. Uh, the what work, what Shiva has done so far, if I want to put a simple pointer, I can redirect the site in five minutes, right? A couple of very easy, straightforward, right? But yeah. I want to make it work like a functional website, like dot right. com uh, slash portfolio, whatever it is. Uh, I'll look for your instructions and we can I will let you know. Okay, yeah, I'll send that to you. Yes. Like, uh, I also... You want to come here? Yes, uh, I might as well. Yeah, I have a similar question, like, if you have a, if you are allowing guest user, but you only want to allow guest user who has the non-profit, that, that company email, non-profit email, like, oh, like, oh. Uh, like, uh, jerseystand.org, but they are not, uh, buy licenses. no, they are not active license, but we want to allow them to enter, uh, Part information of on the <laughs> cloud. Like just to bypass his sales no 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 bus. it's it's like <laughs> it's it's like it's like for like just enter like school or a new contact on the experience. yeah well okay. one thing you could do yeah so you would set up a public screen here that allows input you could then make a decision after that screen if you want to continue based on their inputs or end the flow or send them somewhere else. The email exists or not, you're not, don't allow yeah. it. Yeah. How to allow it. Yeah. Okay. You could do that. Yeah. So you would query for a contact. If you find one, then continue. If you don't find one, then end the flow. Yeah. I told you before when I started the session, Kevin is a guy with all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> 